a Catholic priest is born from above. I welcome you to the program and you might wonder how I could come up with such a strange title. Well, the title is the name of the testimony of the man that I'm going to interview. He claims to be born from above. Uh, this is strange because um, a Catholic viewer would say, well, what more did he need? He was a Catholic priest and he had been ordained validly by the Catholic Church and why did he need to be born from above? I mean, he had everything. And uh, so I'm going to probe and uh, into the life of Henry Nowakowski and it's, um, it's going to be uh, difficult questions and I just, um, as I introduce you uh, to the program, welcome Henry, I'm just warning you, okay. <laughs> I'm going to come up with some difficult questions, so be forewarned and uh, it's, uh, it's strange that you could make this claim and we want to see just how valid it is and what you had known personally in your own life. Where did you grow up first of all as, as a child? Uh. Well, let me say, Richard, that in two months from now, I'll be celebrating my 76th birthday, uh, which means I was born somewhat two years before the outbreak of World War II. Um, mind you, I was never consulted as to when I would be born, where I would be born, or to whom I would be born. Uh, that decision was made for me by the creator of the universe. God himself decreed, decided, that I would be born on August the 18th, 1937, to John and Nellie Nowakowski, um, second generation Canadians. My grandparents came from Poland, emigrated to Canada in the late 1800s. Uh, they were farmers by trade, and uh, I uh, began my physical life there in rural Alberta, Canada. Um, I had uh, two older brothers, both now deceased, and then later two younger sisters who are still living. So that's how my, my first birth occurred, my physical birth. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, my second birth, my birth from above, my spiritual birth, would not occur for many years later. In fact, I was in my 45th year before that would happen. Yeah, well, let's stay to it. Okay, <laughs> Which I okay. Don't, what was the key, could you say, to your upbringing? Um, I would have to say that the key concept was to never, ever question church authority. The parish church, the parish priest was God's man. And when he spoke, it was like God himself speaking. And he, of course, represented the bishop, who in turn represented the Pope in Rome, uh, the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ, who was infallible, who couldn't uh, make any errors in faith and morals. So that was the legacy in which I was, uh, you could say, indoctrinated. Uh, and I have to say indoctrination is good if it is in the truth. But if it is in falsehood and error, it is deadly. Uh, so that was the legacy in which I grew up. And um, I remember the reverence with which my parents held the parish priest. It was always, yes, Father, no, Father. So that was my beginning. That was your beginning. Well, is it because you so uh, admired priests that you wanted to become a priest yourself? Or why did you decide to, to think of the priesthood? Well, growing up, I would be what you consider a good boy. Almost always obedient, uh, loving and kind. Um, and uh, uh, I was never an intellectual. I got average grades in school. Uh, but uh, my parents placed a lot of, uh, even though they weren't uh, educated themselves, they didn't have much formal education, as I said, uh, but uh, they placed a lot of emphasis on the education of their children, which I give them credit for that. 
and uh, they sent uh, the, my two older brothers and I to a Catholic boarding school. And uh, this was the, uh, uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph were the teachers in the school. So uh, when I was entering the 10th grade, my oldest brother, John Jr., entered the Diocesan Seminary, St. Joseph's in Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, he had uh, a great deal of influence over me at the time, as did uh, the sisters in the school, as did the parish priest, the St uh, Father Stewart at the time. And uh, one year after completing high school, I, along with a classmate of mine, entered that same diocesan seminary. In the intervening year, I uh, helped my father on the family farm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yes. So this, and uh, did you then um, decide to go into a seminary? And what was the first year or two like at the seminary? Um, I have to say that the uh, uh, the seminary was marked by a lot of self-denial, and again wrote prayers, wrote practices. I can still hear that bell at 5.30 in the morning waking us, and, uh, and the ringer of the bell uh, singing out Benedicamus Domino. So in a way, seminary was a, like a boot, boot camp, and the saying was, you keep the rules, and the rules will keep you. Uh, that was my uh, experience in the seminary. In the first two years, uh, the concentration was on the study of philosophy. And the philosophy we studied, by and large, was that of the imagined pagan philosopher Aristotle, who lived, what, some 300 years before the birth of Christ. And uh, the reason was that Thomas Aquinas, who is the main theologian of the Roman Catholic Church, who lived in the 1200s, he based his philosophy and theology on the principles of Aristotle. So the, those first two years were the, in the study of uh, philosophy. Right, and then you had uh, four more years to go, the Correct. six years Correct. training altogether. So were the four years concentrated on scripture then and that you would be ready to be a good priest and you would mean to well, be able to preach and teach and what, what, what were your studies as, as a as, you know during the four years well not exactly theology. based on the scriptures it was based more on the theology of thomas aquinas uh, and he wrote the summa theologica and uh, our studies by and large were based on that and of course, he based his uh, on the principles of Aristotle. So we, we studied, for instance, dogmatic theology. And I remember the first course we, we had in dogmatic theology was to try and prove that the Roman Catholic Church was the one true Catholic and apostolic church. It was the only true church. So that was the first course we had in dogmatic theology. We also studied ethics. We studied uh, the you know canon law, the the laws of the canon of the Catholic Church. Uh, we studied the encyclicals of the popes, both present and past. Um, we got into social justice a lot. Uh, so uh, I would have to say that the scriptures took second and third place. They were not paramount in our studies throughout those six years, they were sort of an afterthought. Yes, so that's, it's frightening to think that a man has been trained as a, to, claiming to be a Christian minister and is not basing exactly. studies on the, on the scripture, but uh, on all of these other things, including the pagan philosopher Aristotle. And uh, this all led up to the time when you were due to be ordained. Uh, when were you ordained? and? What, where did it happen? What was the circumstances of your ordination as a Catholic priest? Well, after the six years of study in the seminary, uh, I was ordained along with a number of other classmates of mine um, in, uh, at St. James Parish in Edmonton. This was on June the 1st of 1962. 
and uh, we were ordained by the Archbishop, Archbishop Anthony Jordan, uh, OMI, and OMI stands for Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Um, and uh, my first Mass was celebrated the following day in, at St. Columba's Church in Clan Donald. And by those names, you, you would see that uh, it, it had that Scottish influence because uh, the community in which I grew up was settled by the Scots and uh, followed by the Irish. Uh, but by this time, it was more ethnically diverse. So that was uh, my ordination. And it was very joyous and solemn occasion, especially for family members. And uh, my ministry began shortly after that when I was posted to my first charge, which, which was at Vegreville, Alberta. And um, shortly after, I have to say my, my ministry began in rather rocky fashion because shortly after I was posted to that parish, I came down with hepatitis. So for the next six months or so, I was in and out of the hospital. And it was only uh, then that a specialist in Edmonton diagnosed, diagnosed my case as being one of Gilbert's disease. It's a condition of the liver and uh, happily I found out that it wasn't life-threatening. Uh, during that first year I was uh, given the charge of a mission church in Mundare. Mundare was a, a smaller community. Um, it was uh, pretty well Ukrainian and they had their own Ukrainian Catholic Church. But there was a fairly good um, what uh, segment of the population that were Polish in origin. So with a name such as mine, even though I didn't really know the language, the Archbishop thought it would be a good fit. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, where he assigned me. And uh, during that year, I was uh, really surprised to see how these Polish people were so devoted to their relics, you know, to their statues, to their medals, to their, uh, to their Mary. In fact, within the confines of that parish, uh, there was a grotto, and uh, dedicated to Mary, of course, with a big statue and all, and on August 15th of each year, Feast of the Assumption, there would be throngs of pilgrims that co would come to honor Mary. They, they would uh, go to confession, they would receive communion, they would hear uh, sermons in Polish throughout the day and into the evening hours, and uh, it took on sort of an uh, atmosphere of a carnival. Uh, I remember during that first year I officiated at several uh, funerals and I can still recall all the, these years later uh, the weeping and crying that took place at the gravesite of these poor un unenlightened people as ones without any hope. But there was I as a, their novice pastor a novice shepherd with no hope either. So there I was. That, that is strange. It's uh, quite unusual that you started off with your own congregation. You usually start off as a curate or something. Did you continue well, as a priest? Well, or were you the, I, I, I was actually a curate assigned to the uh, parish in Vegreville, but my charge, uh, besides what I did there, was this parish of uh, Polish people right, right. because of what the, the Archbishop uh, thought. But within the year I was, uh, uh, I received a second posting and that was to uh, a parish in the city south side of Edmonton, uh, St. Anthony's. It was an affluent parish. Uh, the parish priest was uh, a Monsignor Foreign and some thought of him as being a frustrated bishop and he ran a rather tight ship. Uh, uh, he would make known to those within within the rectory that whatever happens in the rectory stays in the rectory. <laughs> and 
he was given uh, to certainly overeating. He was given to uh, watching television all hours of the day and night. And uh, when he would awaken mid-morning, first thing he would do is check the Edmonton Journal and check the races for the day, the horse races. And he would, <laughs> he would have the uh, housekeeper, Mary, uh, uh, go to the bookie down the street to place his bets. Uh, and every January, for the full month of January, he, he and his priest friend Bert O'Brien uh, would go south to play the ponies, as they said, uh, <laughs> where, where they weren't recognized. Yes, yes, uh, so, yes. So that was the example I had uh, pretty well out of the box, out of the seminary. It was a very good example <laughs> that you were learning. <laughs> Not with really. This gambling, uh, Monsignor, you know, yeah. so that that that, uh, that 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 is quite quite <laughs> strange. And uh, where did you go from there? What was where? What was the next step? The next step was uh, another parish. Uh, this time it was at Wainwright, Alberta, and I was uh, not only working in the parish, but I was attached to the military there because they had a military establishment there at Wainwright, so that was uh, uh, part of uh, what I did. Yeah. Now, um, from what you tell me, I can see that uh, you were ordained just prior to the quite well-known Second Ecumenical Council, you know, Vatican Council. Correct. And uh, did, um, can you remember then the early 60s and what was like well, back I, then? Well, I, I certainly can because it was a time of change and uh, it was as though the Catholic world was awakened. Uh, there was a lot happening in the early 60s. Uh, we, we had uh, the space travel starting, we had the Vietnamese War uh, beginning. Well, we had an assassination of an American president, President Kennedy, in 63, and we also had the opening of the council, Vatican II. Uh, John, uh, John XXIII, uh, the Pope at the time, decided to open a window and let some fresh air into the stale uh, establishment, the stale uh, institution of the Roman Catholic Church. Maybe. Uh, didn't bargain for what happened <laughs> because of the chaos yes, that, per yes, uh, that yes. ensued. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, I remember that time very well and uh, the key at that time was uh, to start questioning authority. Not only outside the church but also inside the church that uh, 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 that authority was questioned. Now, during this whole period of Vatican II, as I look back at it now, I think of it as reshuffling the deck chairs on board the Titanic. It was still sinking. It was still going down. Uh, the, there was a lot, a lot of changes, vernacular in the Mass, uh, you know, now we could eat meat on Friday. And, you know, so many changes came about because of Vatican II. But uh, they were peripheral. Vatican II never revisited the Council of Trent, the Council in the mid-1500s, when the institutional Roman Church drove a stake through the Gospel, claiming that Christ is not enough. You need more than Christ. That was in reaction to what the reformers were, were doing. So uh, when I look back in hindsight, I see that, again, just a, a reshuffling, never going back to the, to the biblical gospel. Yeah, did it change your personal perspective on things? Well, I have to say it in many, many ways. Because now I started questioning. You know, it got me to question. Before that, I was very gullible. Now I started asking questions. How does this line up? And I, and I wasn't really uh, lining things up with the scriptures then. But, but it didn't make sense to me that one day, eating meat on Friday was a mortal sin. And by doing that, you could 
condemn yourself to hell for all eternity. And then the next day the council would say, it's no longer an infraction. How can this be? You know, so, so uh, you know, there, there are only two sources of knowledge, either God or man. Now, if the institutional church receives its knowledge from God, then what they say should stack up with the biblical record, with the, with the scriptures. But unfortunately, it didn't and it doesn't line up with the scriptures, which tells me that it is not from God, it is from man. And you know how man's heart is deceitful. Wow, this is, a, <laughs> I can imagine how you felt and it was a, well what are you going to do then? Are you going to continue in this church that, uh, you know, teaches these things and changes its teaching and, you know, and uh, it's the exact opposite of what it was before. What, what, were, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? Well, believe me, I became more and more frustrated. More and more, it, it was so disappointing. Uh, and I started likening uh, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to the Pharisees of the time of Jesus. So I knew I had to, to, to leave. And many uh, w w there in the Archdiocese were leaving, uh, mainly because of, the, uh, of celibacy. Many left. Uh, but it's not so simple to leave an institution that you've been a player in for that many years and where you were indoctrinated in this. It's not a simple thing because there are, I had many ties with family, with friends, and what a shame it would be for, for me to leave even though others left before. Uh, it would bring such shame on my family. It would bring shame especially on my oldest brother who was very devout and devoted uh, functional priest because uh, and, and I had where do I go I mean I don't have any resources I didn't I wasn't trained uh, to be a teacher or, or anything like that I didn't have a trade so it's a very daunting you know task so uh, I, I was trained to be a functional priest in other words to be a dispenser of God's grace through the rites of the institutional church. I was trained uh, to dispense the sacraments uh, and uh, the loftiest of them was, uh, was the Mass and the Eucharist. So that's what my training was. So what do I do? Well, there was an escape hatch. Uh, sort of a halfway house. Uh, you see, when I was uh, studying theology uh, for three summers, I spent uh, with the Canadian military, with the Canadian Air Force. I served as a flight, flight cadet, uh, assisti assisting chaplains at various bases. Um, and my last posting was uh, to Zweibrook in Germany. So I had an in with the military. And uh, that's what I did, I, uh, the, the bishop, the archbishop reluctantly gave his permission and, and I applied to the uh, chaplaincy corps and in 1975 I became a chaplain. I was there for, for three years uh, serving with the, with the military. I received a captain's salary and uh, so I was able to uh, get a what a uh, stash of cash <laughs> uh, to uh, to get me when when I made the transition into the real world. Yeah, but how how were you going to get into the real world? When did you make the final well, break as it were? <laughs> well, I knew I had to make it long before I did. And I finally made that break uh, actually on Canada Day, July the first of nineteen seventy eight. I remember it fondly because I left with a lot of trepidation 
And at that time, I started my new life. I, I went to the Los Angeles area. And uh, it wasn't much fun, you know, because uh, at that time, my belief system was in shambles. I didn't really know what to believe. In fact, I, I wandered off into metaphysics and the science of mind and Eastern meditation, trying to make sense of it all. And uh, I had more to worry about, too. I had to make a way for myself. So I find, found work with, uh, say, Farmer John's packing sausages. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I sold pre-need cemetery uh, property for Forest Lawn. I, uh, I got into telemarketing. I sold everything from oil and gas leases to uh, uh, investment grade diamonds over the phone. And uh, along the way I, I met a number of friends. I made a number of friends and one of these was uh, Leo Vigella. And uh, it was he that introduced me uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Walter Martin. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin was on the radio at, and he was known as the Bible Answer Man. And he was instrumental in bringing me to realize that my good works were like filthy rags. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's a so that, huge, that, huge that, that, that was that was a breakthrough mm -hmm. you know for me to realize my condition uh, and then um, that was the Old Testament Isaiah saying that what about the New Testament well, so when I went to the New Testament first I saw the historical record I, I saw the Gospels, I saw the Book of Acts, I, I saw where the promised Messiah came in the person of Jesus Christ, a virgin birth and, and all. He was born, uh, he proclaimed who he was, the, 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 the Messiah, he, he performed miracles, uh, he went to the cross, he died, he was buried. He rose and uh, he ascended and is at the right hand of the Father. So that's the historical record. But what, what does it all mean? What does that mean? Well, you have to go a little further in the New Testament to, to find out what it meant. And uh, beginning with the uh, book of Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul explains what all that meant. Uh, the book of Romans, which has become my favorite book in all of the Bible, uh, really is the treatise on salvation. What salvation really is. And uh, every revival that has taken place, including the Reformation, began with that book of Romans. Because in the first chapters, particularly chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is saying, there is no unrighteous not one. There's no one that seeks after God. Not even one. So he, 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 all men, all natural men are just destroyed. And that's the bad news. I know, but that hits me so hard to, thinking of you. You were dead in sin too. And how, how did you, what did you do? How was this being born again from above? How was this going to occur? Well, well, uh, Paul doesn't leave us there. You know, uh, there, there, aren't more, there are more than three chapters in the book of Romans. Because uh, he not only shows that all are condemned, all natural men are condemned, not only the Jew, but the Gentile as well. And, and, and I saw myself right there, you know. But, but there's good news coming. Uh, he sort of summarizes the good news in, in chapter 5, verse 1, where he writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you are at peace with God. In other words, it, that, that one sentence is so, so key, so important. Having been justified. In other words, we, we are at peace with God uh, 
and we are justified, we are no longer God's enemies. And how does that come about? See, having been justified, that, that's past tense. In the Greek, it's the aorist tense, so it is a completed act, one-time completed act. How are we justified? We're justified by faith. Did Paul say we're justified by baptism? No. Are we justified by our good works? No. Are we justified by, uh, by the rights of the church? No. No, he says justified by faith, by believing, by trusting. Where is that faith? In Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one and the only one that is Savior, and he's a complete Savior. So, so that was the key for me. Uh, that that uh, particular, you know, uh, book of the Bible and that particular verse right there. So were you convinced at the time then that you did believe on that and that alone and that the, that you were right with God and did you experience well, what it is to be born from well, above? That, that certainly brought me to my knees, that brought me to repentance because I recall so vividly uh, there I was renting a small house in Downey, California and kneeling at my bed. This was in April of 1984. And uh, realizing my need, realizing that all my good works were, like Isaiah says, like filthy rags. And uh, I cried out to the Lord. And I accepted Christ and Him alone as my perfect Savior and made him the Lord of my life at that time. And that's when I was born from above. And, and it, it was like, uh, a, a, you know, two ton, uh, I mean, weight lifted off my shoulders. It, it, it's unbelievable. You know, the simplicity of the gospel, that uh, I, here I was for 40 years, striving, 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 uh, penance, uh, good works, uh, Praying sacraments and everything yeah. thrown in, yeah. but I, I I never did have full assurance of my salvation. You know, Isn't throughout right? that yeah. period of time, it was only at that point in my life uh, that I say I was born from above, my second birth, uh, at forty-five years of well, age. Yeah, praise God! But they just begin telling you. Your, well, your family and everything, how did they <laughs> respond to this? <laughs> uh, this was such a precious gift to me, knowing that I was secure, knowing that I, uh, I was going to be with, with the Lord, with God for all eternity, that uh, I had to share it. You know, I had to go and tell others about it. And certainly family and friends were the ones. And I remember going back from my father's funeral and that would be January, late January 1984. And um, uh, I remember they, they were welcoming, uh, but uh, it was unspoken uh, that uh, they were waiting for me to return to Mother Church. They, uh, they considered me as uh, sort of a rebel. You know, uh, uh, I, I turned my back on the one true Catholic Church and uh, they, they, they were praying for me. I remember my, my brother, the priest, uh, every Christmas he would send me a, a card and it would say that you are being remembered in my Christmas Masses. <laughs> <laughs> Signed, Father John. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so they, they saw me as that uh, prodigal son, that wayward son, and of course they were wanting me back into Mother Church. Yeah, wow, that, that, yeah. That, that is, I can imagine, that the difficulty then. But then in the 80s, was anything, any other major event as the 80s went on? Well, uh, let, let me say that over a period of time, as far as witnessing is concerned to my family and friends, I realized that God was sovereign over all things. And salvation is part of that. He is sovereign over all, and he's going to call whom he will. Uh, and uh, from the foundations of the world, there are those that are chosen, those that are elect, 
it is in God's hands. I, I found that uh, salvation is of God. But uh, back to the 80s. Uh, the 80s were really precious to me because not only did I receive uh, my second birth, being born from above, I accepted the true biblical gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I, I was reborn. I was born from above. Uh, and uh, I had greater opportunities in, you know, uh, my work, uh, business and so on, so I became more stable financially. Uh, but my second most precious gift uh, was uh, meeting my wife, my future wife, in Edith, in 84. That was September, and we were married in December. And she has been just a, a wonderful gift from, from the Lord. Uh, she's been a faithful, loving companion. Uh, uh, she, she loves the Lord. She loves God. She loves His Word. And together we have grown in, in the love of that Word. And uh, also I was blessed by having mentors in the faith, uh, pastors uh, that were reformed, and who uh, guided me throughout, uh, you know, uh, but uh, my, we presently attend uh, Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills, and our pastor, Philip De DeCourcy, is uh, an expository teacher and preacher of the Word. And, and I have had men like that throughout this period yeah, of time. Well, good, good, but I'm still sort of <laughs> aghast that oh. you, you said it's the sovereignty of God, salvation. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, there are not many who say that, and, uh, you know, the, I mean, how can you say that? What's the use then of, say, the, our listener and our viewer saying, well, you know, I would, you know, I've experienced my difficulties in Catholicism, and I would like to be born again from above. I'd like to believe on Christ, and if you say, "Wow, no, it's it's the sovereignty of God," <laughs> how would you reply? Would well, well, when, when when you search the scriptures, it's so evident that God is sovereign, and if you if you read chapter nine of the book of Romans, it, it's so it, 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 Paul makes it so evident. Uh, he says, uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Uh, God is the potter, we are the clay. He makes some to noble view, use, some to un in noble use. Uh, so he, he, he is the, uh, uh, the one in charge. He is God, and we're not. Man is not God. And uh, so God is sovereign over all things. Uh, so that to me was was the biggest truth that I discovered uh, as I reminisce over over all this. I know, but uh, why? What about what Jesus said, for example, in in John's Gospel, chapter six, verse twenty-eight, that you say to him, "What must we do?" You know, to and Jesus said, "This is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He has sent." So Jesus said, "We must believe on Him." You know, exactly. that's how we're going to be right exactly. So why would the Lord say that and whoever believes on me will never perish? So these are the Lord's right, own words. Right. So why, why are these things in the scripture? Well, uh, not only is the sovereignty of God made very evident in the scriptures, that is a truth that, that is there throughout from Genesis uh, to the book of Revelation, that God is sovereign. He, he, he picks who he wills. Uh, but there is also the accountability of man. M every man is accountable for his actions. That is a truth taught in the scriptures too. Uh, for instance, in the book of Acts, we're told uh, that uh, God decreed that Christ be crucified. Uh, that uh, was decreed from the foundations of the world. But he also says, Peter also says to those men, you are responsible. You are responsible for putting to death uh, the Son of Glory, the, the Christ. And so you're, you're going to be held accountable for that. So the two truths are there in the scriptures. And uh, they, how, we say, how do we reconcile them? 
Uh, well, we really can't. No man can. Uh, I don't. I haven't heard anyone who could reconcile those two. Uh, the only answer I have is what Isaiah said when he said, "God's ways are not man's ways. God's, you know, thoughts are not, thoughts are not man's thoughts." So that's the the best I can come up with. May, maybe someone else can uh, can do better than that. Uh, but but you, you mentioned something. Uh, I I always think of that question that the Philippian jailer asked of Paul and Silas. He asked, "What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved?" And what was their response? What did Paul? How did Paul respond? Now, if I ask that question of any one of my professors in the seminary, "What must I do to be saved?" They would have parroted the Roman line, which would have been something like this. In order to be saved, you have to be baptized, preferably as an infant. You have to receive all the uh, sacraments, all that uh, are applicable. Uh, and uh, you have to do good, don't do evil. And uh, when you die, if you are in the state of grace as we define it, you will earn heaven for yourself. You will earn it. It'll be a reward. But what did Paul say? He didn't say anything like that. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Uh, he didn't say be baptized or anything like that. Believe. Trust in Christ and trust in Him alone. That was his response. Yeah, well that is a wonderful message and a wonderful message for our viewer and uh, anyone listening. This is a, a a great encouragement. Can you summarize in the in the minutes that we have left then what you would say to the viewer now? What, what would you your final word of well, exhortation? Well uh, I would say cry out to the Lord. Cry out for salvation if you are not already saved. You know, cry out, ask that he might open your heart to receive Christ as your personal Savior, as your personal Lord and Savior, uh, to, to give you that faith, because faith comes from him too. Uh, I would have to say, maybe I've mentioned this already, that the, uh, that the uh, book of Romans is my favorite book in the entire Bible, but I would have to say also that the uh, my favorite verse is uh, from uh, the, the epistle, the letter to the Ephesians, where Paul, in chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, says, By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, least any man should boast, not of works. And so if we look at that, it is by grace. Grace is the basis and, and grace cannot be earned. It is a gift, unmerited favor. It is God's gift to us. And, and through faith, faith is the instrumental cause. Faith is that hand held out, uh, lambano in the Greek, holding out that empty hand. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not a work. It, you know, faith is is that instrumental cause uh, and it's through Christ and him alone. Well praise God that is a, a glorious message and it really answers the question that I had challenged you with uh, how can you be born from above and uh, you really have very clearly uh, laid it out in your own in your own testimony. You said an interesting thing early on it's just in, at the back of my mind you said that it's Romans where you really see the message and uh, particularly I think in chapter 3 where where the Apostle Paul as it were gets enthusiastic oh, yes. he said now the righteousness of God is revealed mm -hmm. from heaven even the mm -hmm. righteousness of God which is by faith of by Jesus faith. Christ exactly. unto all and upon them that believe there is no difference exactly. and uh, then he says in verse 23 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of mm -hmm. God. And that's where that's where I found myself as right, a Catholic right, right. priest after after all my years of serving to that I found I was dead in sin, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How can I manage? And I I cried out to God for mm -hmm. faith and grace and he gave it to me and I trusted on him alone. And I think that it's in your heart and it's my heart to say to the viewer, trust on Christ alone. Exactly. Whether you're from a Catholic background or just an ordinary person, dead in trespass and sins and no interest in Christianity, it's the same message, yeah. trust on him alone. Yes. And that is the answer to life and it's a glorious answer. And it says, and it's summarized in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. I mean, it's, it's, it's twice. It's, mm -hmm. it's a gift and it's freely right. through the righteousness. I, I, I would like to Christ add Jesus. something uh, uh, to what you say. Uh, every false religion says do, D-O, do, 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 do. It works righteousness. True religion, true biblical religion, the Christian faith, adds two letters to that word do. Instead of D-O, it is D-O-N-E, done. Uh, remember what Jesus said as he was dying on that cross? It is finished, meaning paid in full. He accomplished all. He is the perfect Savior. Not as Mother Teresa says, he did 95% of the work, but I have to do the other five. No, Mother Teresa, you are wrong. Jesus did 100% of the work. He is that perfect, perfect Savior. And it is when we look to him and he imputes his righteousness to us that we are truly born from above and will spend eternity in his heaven. Praise God, that is a wonderful s summary. Uh, like uh, the Apostle Paul said in chapter 8, there's now no condemnation Correct. for those in Christ Jesus. And I, I thank God you have really given a clear description of what it was to be born again and how you saw that you were destitute and mm -hmm. it was only the grace of God could save you and he has gloriously done that. And um, those as you watch and I thank you for watching I ask that if you have any questions you'd like to ask uh, Henry Nowakowski mm -hmm. uh, just uh, click the email address there mm -hmm. at the foot of your screen and we will uh, uh, you can write to him or send it to me and I will forward it to Henry and uh, we'd love to hear from you it's one of the joys of making these programs mm -hmm. and uh, the, those who um, run the equipment behind the scenes that we hear from people and that's the, the glorious thing we hear from you. So it's a wonderful encouragement to know and to, to know people who have then, by God's grace, been born again in the same way. And we say all praise, glory and worship be to, to our him. sovereign God. God. So, and that's a, mm. I thank you for this program, Henry, and it's a stimulating to my own heart to, to ask you these questions and to hear your answers. And may God be glorified. May his name be glorified now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.